Okay, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to open the next session, the CIRAC session. Before I present our keynote speaker, I would like to open with a very short introducing case before we then go to the main uh, uh, talk. And uh, I would like to present a male 30-year-old man. He's a professional soccer player. He was referred for chronic abdominal pains and bloating, had no real past medical history. In the evaluation, there was a positive serology for uh, antitranslutinase EIGA, so uh, celiac disease was suspected. He received the uh, upper endoscopy with biopsies from the duodenum, which confirmed the diagnosis with uh, intraepithelial lymphocytosis and with atrophy in the duodenum with a Marsh classification of 3B. He started on the gluten-free diet and also received counseling by a dietitian. The serology then improved under the diet. It didn't completely normalize with the value last in July 2020 of 25. His symptoms also improved, but he had, hard, had a hard time sticking to the strict diet and probably ingested once or twice gluten during traveling with symptoms also affecting his athletic performance. And uh, he, was, uh, he received another follow-up endoscopy then, which showed a good improvement, so he was doing quite fine. He had no villus atrophy anymore and only uh, intraepithelial lymphocytosis with Marsh classification of one. And uh, he was always told, okay, you're doing fine. You have to be more strict with the diet. Your uh, serology didn't improve completely. And, um, and uh, now is the question, what other options do we have? And is there a light at the end of the tunnel next to the gluten-free diet with uh, emerging therapies coming? And it's my great honor to introduce Peter Green, he's professor of medicine at the Columbia University Medical Center and director of the Select Disease Center of the Columbia University in New York. Um, he has a long history in Select disease. He already started to get interested in Select disease in the 1990s where very less was known about the disease and uh, uh, started building up a celiac clinic and doing a lot of research and uh, founding the Celiac Disease Center in New York in 2001. And it has become one of the biggest and well-known celiac disease centers in the world. Uh, I got to know Peter first, 2018, when I visited his center to get an experience how they work. and. Uh, this evolved to a very good friendship and uh, work together. I probably visited this center now a dozen of times and hopefully many years to come. And it's a great honor to have him here in Zurich today and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Jonas. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this wonderful meeting and uh, to learn about your beautiful city. So, um, celiac disease is common. It's considered to occur in about 1% of the population worldwide. Interestingly, there are some countries with, in which it's a bit less than 1%, and, uh, like Germany, and countries uh, in which it's a bit higher than 1%, like Australia. Um, the treatment is a gluten-free diet. And as you know, gluten is the term for the storage protein in wheat, rye, and barley. Now, much is known about the pathophysiology of celiac disease, um, which is considered to be an autoimmune disease. So it's a, a model of autoimmunity, but it's unique in that we know the environmental precipitant. Now, to understand the development of pathophysiology, I'm going to go through uh, how we get this disease. So um, we uh, did not evolve to eat wheat. Uh, we evolved to eat meat. When we eat meat, our peptidases chop up all the protein into single amino acids, dimers, and trimers. But in, uh, when we ingest gluten, 
we're left with these large molecules that are about 33 amino acids long. That's as far as our enzymes will chop up. And now, with all of us, these molecules readily pass through the intestinal wall and we'll excrete it. Like if we have a sandwich for lunch, we're going to be peeing out these uh, gluten immunogenic peptides later in the day. This, this is a, it's quite amazing. Uh, patients get this thing, I like I have increased intestinal permeability. So well, yes, you're normal. We all have this intestinal permeability increase. Um, so these, we're left with these large molecules, and uh, when they get into the lamina propria, they get deamidated by tissue transglutaminase, which is represented here in uh, pink. So it's a ubiquitous enzyme. It's present in the enterocytes and obviously along the basement membrane. And uh, in this diagram, these are the epithelial cells. The green cells are T cells and uh, the red cells are plasma cells. So tissue transglutaminase becomes activated, maybe say during a viral infection, and that will deamidate these large gliadin molecules, which then changes their shape and size and allows them to sit in the groove of the HLA DQ2 or DQ8 molecule, which then presents this deamidated gliadin peptide to T cells, which then release uh, cytokines and uh, various tissue remodeling factors, which are responsible for villus atrophy. And uh, by the way, uh, so a little bit technologically, um, and so this uh, is active celiac disease, and you can see that there's a marked proliferation of plasma cells. Um, and uh, an increase in the intraepithelial lymphocytes, but not that much of a great increase in the T cells in the lamina propria. And then as a byproduct, uh, the B cells and plasma cells will secrete a plethora of antibodies, antibodies to tissue transglutaminase, antibodies to native gliadin, to deaminated gliadin, to a gliadin TTG complex, uh, antibodies to the endomesium, and other antibodies such as anti-nuclear antibodies and anti-actin antibodies, smooth muscle antibodies. So this is a very metabolically active uh, inflammation and I always regard celiac disease as an inflammatory bowel disease. People are sick from the inflammation that's going on there. So what's the management of celiac disease? So way back in 2004, we were involved with the NIH Consensus Development Conference, and you can see uh, the management, um, consultation with a dietitian, education, etc. And I've starred the role of the dietitian because it's a dietary managed condition, and the dietitian is very important. But when we did this survey of over 400 patients with celiac disease, we found that only, um, not everyone saw a dietitian. 20% never saw a dietitian, 40% um, saw them once, and 40% uh, had multiple encounters with a dietitian that we do recommend. Uh, and patients come along and say, I know all about it. I know all about gluten-free diet. I say, you've got to see the dietitian, um, not only to make sure that your diet is gluten-free, but it's healthy and varied, because I'll point out later that a gluten-free diet is not a healthy diet, despite it being the most Googled diet in the United States. Um, so the gluten-free diet was a major breakthrough in therapy, uh, improved countless lives over the last um, you know, 80 years. It's generally effective in most patients. It's generally safe as a long-term therapy. Uh, there is potential for nutritional deficiencies, um, and some people tolerate. I have patients say, I can't tolerate a gluten-free diet. I get sick every time. Okay. Um, and it is very difficult to maintain these days because uh, gluten is, uh, wheat flour is ubiquitous in uh, so much of the products that we ingest. Um, and this study in that well-known journal, Appetite, um, from northern uh, England um, showed that 
most people are ingesting gluten. Um, only 30% of this uh, 250 odd patients had no intentional or inadvertent lapses. Uh, others, 30% uh, intentional and known inadvertent, etc. So there's a variant of some people will intentionally. Um, I've been to a meeting in which uh, eight gastroenterologists were around the table, two of whom had celiac disease. And uh, one guy had to leave early, so he reached over and he put a bread roll in his pocket and left. So it's inevitable that people are ingest, going to ingest gluten, both intentionally and inadvertently. Um, and even, uh, you know, one feels for people with celiac disease because it's like the world is against them. So this was a study done by a food science uh, lab in Idaho in which they determined that there was gluten contamination of foods labeled gluten-free. And, um, you know, th there's no zero gluten. Gluten-free is considered to be less than 20 parts per million. And you can see in this study in which they tested 78 gluten-free samples that 20% had more than 20 milligrams per kilogram. So these people, and they were five of the eight breakfast cereals that were tested. So individuals buying gluten-free food are, getting, are going to be eating gluten. Um, now, we're very conscious about oats being contaminated. And um, the majority of people, but not all uh, subjects, um, tolerate oats. Uh, some individuals develop the gluten-type celiac lesion secondary to oats. But most of individuals can tolerate oats but the trouble is uh, birds fly, um, oats become contaminated with wheat. And, um, but this study by Thompson et al. looked at other grains and they showed that millet flour and soy flour are also contaminated with oats. Um, and uh, like with much more than 20 parts per million. So once again, individuals buying uh, gluten-free uh, flowers are going to be getting gluten through uh, no fault of their own. And then, so we were interested in looking at the data from this little uh, portable gluten detector. So individual, this is a MEMA device, NEMA device, and um, you know, so the individual can uh, put a little bit of aliquot of uh, food in uh, this thing, and uh, if it's gluten-free, you get a smiley face. Uh, if it's got gluten in it, you get a frown. So how people are <laughs> supposed to handle this in a restaurant, I don't know, you demand your money back, you throw it at the chef, you know, et cetera. But uh, we managed to get uh, the data um, because, uh, you know, this will feed all the data in. And so when we looked at this, um, we... Uh, um, got the data from NEMA, and uh, they looked at, um, so we looked at uh, 4,500 foodstuffs tested, and it was uh, the restaurant where it was, what the food was, etc. And what we found in this was that uh, approximately one third of the restaurant foods that were tested contained gluten in it. Um, and it was mainly uh, pizza and pasta, uh, during the evening meal was more likely to contain gluten. So once again, individuals going to a restaurant, eating out, normal events for all of us are getting gluten. Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit uh, gluten-free chocolate chip cookie. Um, careful, it could contain gluten. And there are limitations with a gluten-free diet. Um, mo Despite being on a gluten-free diet, uh, most individuals will suffer episodic symptoms. Um, and uh, about 10% of individuals don't do very well, and they may be classified as poorly responsive or truly refractory to the diet. And all the studies show between 30 and 60% of individuals with celiac disease don't heal their mucosa. And the reason for that is that they're getting gluten, despite their best intentions. Um, 
And then what do patients think about it? So this was a study out of uh, Boston in which patients were asked their perception of treatment burden. And you can see that the perceived treatment burden of celiac disease patients was second only to that of patients with end-stage renal failure. Um, so patients perceive this as being very difficult for them. Um, and it doesn't take very much gluten to cause damage. You know, a slice of bread has got about three grams of gluten in it. That's a lot of gluten. And you can see that in uh, the, this amount of gluten, 50 milligrams a day um, over 90 days resulted in villus shortening. So you don't need to give much gluten to create damage. And then the other thing we're worried about is what we're doing to these patients. Um, you know, many of them are crazy, and I, we wonder what is making these individuals crazy. So we were interested in this hypervigilance to a gluten-free diet and its effect on quality of life. And this was individuals that we saw, and you can see that um, the extremely vigilant individuals who had greater knowledge about a gluten-free diet. This is someone who will quiz the dietitian, uh, qu quiz the wait staff, the chef, may take their own food uh, when they go out, etc. They had a lower quality of life. So the extremely vigilant individuals had a, low, had a worse quality of life and uh, th in three of the four subclasses and they were more knowledgeable. So there seems to be a great price that individuals are paying for adhering to the gluten-free diet. And then we we're very worried about these maladaptive eating behaviors um, uh, because individuals are taught these maladaptive eating behaviors. Um, so adaptive eating behaviors are characterized by greater flexibility versus rigidity, trust, uh, confidence, et cetera, and awareness um, versus uh, um, rigidity, avoidance, uh, controlling behavior, and preoccupation. Uh, and so more than half the individuals, these young individuals, uh, had these maladaptive eating behaviors, and um, it was associated with older age and poorer quality of life. But these maladaptive eating behaviors are known risk factors for eating disorders. And we're very much aware that individuals with celiac disease have an increased rate of eating disorders. So it makes me question, like, what are we doing to these people? And then we have this other circumstance, that people who are well controlled on a gluten-free diet will get symptoms on exposure to gluten. Um, and we're diagnosing celiac disease in individuals that have no symptoms. Like we tell a family member, oh, you've got to tell your, your children to get tested. So the women step forward and the, the boys, the men hang back. You know, the women go like that, the boys like disappear. And uh, because they don't want to get celiac disease, but any individual in a family wants to diagnose everyone else. And so we diagnose many people with celiac disease that are asymptomatic. So they're asymptomatic, and then on the diet, they get symptoms when they get exposed to gluten. And this has been very well shown by Bob Anderson's group who was developing, from Melbourne, who are developing the vaccine. Um, and, and they showed that 92% of people with celiac disease that ate two slices of bread got nausea and threw up, and it's associated with outpourings of IL-2. So they eat, IL-2 comes up, acts on the brain, they throw up. And that, that's the, like, it's interesting when you see these people, I ingest gluten, how do you know? Well, I get fatigue or I get a belly ache, and it's nausea and boom, throwing up. They're the symptoms of gluten exposure. So we have people who are asymptomatic or symptomatic adhering to the diet, get gluten, um, because, you know, it happens. They go, it's gluten-free, they'll eat, and they say, 
They say, oh, that pasta tasted so great. Boom. It, it was not gluten-free. So, and then we're actually seeing individuals who never had dermatitis pediformis, which is a very itchy, pruritic rash that if you get lesions, they can last for like a month. They never had DH. They had GI symptomatic celiac disease. They uh, then go and get dermatitis pediformis, in which they become very sensitive to very small amounts of gluten. So one wonders, like what we're doing, diagnosing this uh, in these people. It was very hard for a young person to say, well, you know, you're going to live longer and you will have a less risk of having a lymphoma, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and then overall, a gluten-free diet, despite it being trendy and um, uh, people attributing great success like Djokovic, uh, attributes the winning of his all the open tennis opens to him being on a gluten-free diet. I read his book actually and the way he di had gluten sensitivity diagnosed was he had a physician hold white bread above his abdomen and tested his strength and consistently when it was white bread he was weaker so he's a big exponent of gluten-free diet. But generally um, a gluten-free diet is low in fiber, iron, and B vitamins because uh, um, ever since after the First World War, uh, wheat flour is fortified with B vitamins and, and iron, but rice flour, uh, millet flour, etc., is not fortified. So it's not uncommon to see someone um, on a strict gluten-free diet who's B vitamin deficient. I've seen people with severe neurological issues to like vitamin B6 deficiency, um, and we'll measure the folate frequently. So uh, gluten-free diet is low in fiber, iron, and B vitamins. And then the products that you buy, you know, these bars, um, if you take gluten out, they add more fat or they add more salt to them uh, to maintain the taste. Um, and then the studies show that individuals on a gluten-free diet have increased heavy metals, uh, increased lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, and urinary tin. Um, and uh, that's thought that it's uh, probably related to not only the fish, but the rice, because rice selectively absorb heavy metals. And when it's grown, say, in the old cotton fields uh, in the south, where they had a lot of arsenic, uh, poisoning the bugs on the cotton, etc. Um, and then studies that we did looking at the uh, nurses uh, study of like over 2,000 individuals and developing a gluten index, the individuals who didn't have celiac disease, um, who had the least gluten ingestion, had increased rates of type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And that's thought that it's related to people who, who don't eat wheat, don't eat whole grains, and whole grains are cardioprotective, etc. I'm getting confused with my equipment here. So why not? Like people, if you have high cholesterol, you eat anything and you take a statin. Um, individuals can have terrible diseases, Crohn's disease, cancers, and their therapies can make them normal. Individuals with celiac disease, like are thinking about what they're gonna eat all the time. Um, so uh, to my mind, and what I hope to have shown you is that uh, people with celiac disease need a, an added therapy. They need a non-dietary therapy. Now, do the individuals want it? Well, this study from uh, Sheffield in the UK asked uh, individuals with celiac disease were they satisfied uh, with a gluten-free diet. And only um, about 25% had good or excellent satisf satisfaction. And all of them were interested in alternate therapy and they were specifically asked, would they take an injection or they take a pill, et cetera. Uh, and then we did a study uh, asking 350 patients and 75% um, of individuals uh, were a great deal, quite a bit or moderately interested. And I thought that that was probably the younger people who just got diagnosed. But in fact, um, it was the uh, older individuals uh, had a much greater, in everyone was interested from that, but there was greater interest in the, amongst the older people, men more than women, and those that ate out, those were dissatisfied with their weight, 
and those concerned with expense of the gluten-free diet. So it's clear that people want it. And then, uh, like the FDA mandates that the companies that are developing therapies have to uh, have um, consideration of, for children. So uh, to, do, to have these therapies and to study children. Um, so we asked uh, close to a thousand uh, people, would they, children, would they want their children um, and uh, to have a, th a therapy to help or replace a gluten-free diet? And there was overwhelming interest. Um, it was safety was the great concern. You know, was it safe? People, um, and they, like, has your child expressed interest? Uh, my child's too young. No, um, but about half said that their children had expressed interest in having some kind of med for this. Um, and in that study in which we asked the parents, the factors that best predicted parental desire for a medication was a parent without celiac disease. So if the parent had celiac disease, the kids should suffer like they're suffering. Um, and only one child uh, with celiac disease in the family, older age at diagnosis, and the parental perception of a poor psychological outcome uh, in the child were factors that predicted um, their parent wanting a therapy. This is really interesting data from the biopharmaceutical um, industry. Um, like, I'll just read this. From, uh, from drug discovery, through FDA approval, developing a new medicine on the average takes at least 10 years and costs $2.6 billion uh, to get from, uh, from here to here. And um, uh, uh, less than 12% of candidate medications that make a phase one study get through to approval. So it's a big process. And uh, as a physician, it's been very eye-opening for me to be involved with these companies. You know, coming out of the universities, uh, speaking to venture capital people um, to help them raise money to keep going, and then finally uh, Big Pharma coming in um, to take over. So um, there's such a lot of uh, money involved with this, and it's just such a process. Uh, this was uh, provided by uh, Francisco Leon, and this was a slide that he put together in 2019, and there were 30 different targets that were being looked at uh, for treatment of celiac disease. Um, they include the hookworm study from uh, Queensland in Australia. Um, where is that, this one? And, um, so, and so what are the therapies that... Uh, are being considered, um, you know, there's um, luminal things like altering wheat. Um, that's very topical and there are uh, companies using like, you, you can't genetically alter wheat, but you can knock out genes. Like, so there's terminology that will allow uh, genetically altered wheat to not be called genetically altered. Um, and. Uh, what, what's being really considered is, uh, so you can alter wheat, uh, you can develop enzymes to digest this uh, non-digested gliadin molecule. Um, there was a study of polymers, much like cholestyramine, or bind bile, bile salts, you know, to, bile the, to bind the uh, gluten peptides, and probiotics having a role. Um, you know, the most developed treatment uh, was this lattaglutinase, which has two enzymes that will digest gluten in the low pH of the stomach. But studies of celiac disease are very difficult. Um, there's, uh, whenever you have a patient in a drug study, you have a run-in study. And unfortunately, um, in celiac disease, as soon as you uh, start the patient recording their symptoms and that they start to alter their behavior and like they don't go out as much they're more careful and so the run-in period starts both groups the placebo and the therapy group getting better right 
And um, so this study, lattiglutinase, which is the um, uh, dual enzyme, like it didn't show uh, benefit uh, overall. But there was a subgroup of patients that had, and patients have to have symptoms because the FDA says that when you get a drug, pe people have to feel better. So we can't take these asymptomatic patients and just improve their villus architecture in the study. You know, they've got to feel better. But there was a subgroup of people in this larger lattiglutinase study that had symptoms and had positive antibodies. So they were definitely eating gluten and they got better. So that gave this drug new life and it is continuing as a therapy. And enzyme therapy is pretty attractive um, to help with a gluten-free diet because physicians are used to using enzymes. You know, there's lactase. Uh, we use them for pancreatic insufficiency, et cetera. So th this has more life and is, uh, there are current studies going on. Uh, lorazotide, which um, is uh, a supposed tight junction uh, regulator. Uh, the recent study showed that it didn't work. So this latter glutenase has been uh, put on the shelf. Um, and then that leaves us with um, drugs that will interfere with this mechanism um, to block the immune response. Um, the phase one study, uh, Jonas and a number of people have been involved with blocking tissue transglutaminase, which seems very attractive because if you, um, if you could block the TTG activity um, in the intestine, you're gonna prevent all this downstream. Um, like the vaccine study in which we were immunizing people with three peptides didn't work, um, but there's another couple of uh, mechanisms uh, for inducing tolerance such as nanoparticles so infusing individuals with gliadin molecules uh, encapsulated which will supposedly get taken up in the spleen induced tolerance is being explored and looks very promising so um, inducing tolerance is so this is the vaccine study coming out of melbourne uh, imusan t vaccinating just against three gliadin peptides uh, that was fascinating. You inject the individuals intradermally um, with this nanoquantities of gliadin peptides and half an hour later, boom, they throw up. Um, so, you know, this gets taken up in the dendritic cell, circulates rapidly to the gut and boom, IL-2 kicks out and, and they throw up. So, um, but unfortunately it didn't work. So that's why the nanoparticle story is attractive because that's whole gliadin molecules, not just um, three of the, of the peptides. Um, so there's promising, and now, um, you know, there's uh, cytokine blockers uh, being developed. And there are reports of uh, individuals losing celiac disease. One case report of... Uh, someone with alopecia totalis, uh, got an off-label drug, um, and their celiac disease went away. So there's, there's great promise, actually. Um, and, but patients are a little bit confused because they think that the therapies are going to replace the diet. And initially, the therapies will get approval to help with the diet. And that's understandable because, you know, the companies are trying to get something on the market. Um, so it'll be to help people with a gluten-free diet. Um, but or individuals with celiac disease don't fully grasp that as yet. So um, to the aims of the therapy will be to assist uh, with a gluten-free diet um, and then hopefully to replace the gluten-free diet. Um, that, that is somewhat worrisome to my mind because, um, you know, like one seen individuals, uh, like in the 40s and the 50s in the United States at least, individuals were told that they uh, had grown out of the condition. So they got diagnosed in like 1947, 
uh, on a gluten-free diet, a banana diet. Uh, then they lived 40 years um, and then developed small intestinal cancer. I've seen three individuals that fulfill that criteria. So to my mind, uh, replacing the diet uh, is going to be very worrisome way, way, a long way uh, after these drugs are developed. Uh, if people have this chronic inflammation, untreated uh, adequate celiac disease, and develop small intestinal adenocarcinoma that's exceptionally rare in the general population, but about a hundredfold more common in individuals with celiac disease. So um, assist with the diet, replace the gluten-free diet, um, and then cure and um, uh, prevention. Uh, and there was big European prevent CD study looking at breastfeeding, um, not protective. Uh, we were giving gluten in small amounts to, to uh, children aged four months, seven months, uh, hoping to protect celiac disease. It did not alter um, these at-risk children. Uh, the chance of them getting celiac disease was totally dependent upon the dose of the uh, HLA DQ2 molecule with homozygous children uh, having a 25% chance of having celiac disease by age five. So um, th these will be the aims uh, to cure the condition and to prevent it. And hopefully, uh, we won't be getting calls, not about GI bleeders in the middle of the night, but, you know, I ate gluten and I'm throwing up, you know. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.